morning, everyone. You're all very welcome to our, our morning service, and it's quite nice to see a bit of a thaw, at least, so the roads are a wee bit safer, which is good. Um, we're going to start our service with our first hymn, which is Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, and we'll stand to sing these words together. The call to worship this morning can be found in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And I was just sort of thinking about patience, um, and these verses came to mind. So 2 Peter chapter 3. And we'll just read uh, from verse 1. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? Forever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the word that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed." 
Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in, be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for the hastening, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. And I was just thinking um, that how, how great it is that God is patient. Um, sometimes I don't have the best of patience, but God is so patient with us. We so often feel him, um, but he is patient for, with us. Um, and when we come to him, he's willing to forgive us. And he's patient with those who aren't saved. And it's just um, a challenge to those that aren't saved that God is patient, but there will come a day um, when he will return. And we don't know that day, and it'll come like a thief in the night. So we need to be ready for that day. But it is just great to know that God is patient with us. So we're going to just open now in a word of prayer. Lord, we, we just thank you for who you are, Lord. We thank you that you are so great and so awesome and so powerful, Lord, and so holy, Lord, but yet you are also patient, Lord, and you're patient towards us, Lord. And thank you, Lord, just for your patience and mercy towards us, Lord. Thank you for saving us, Lord. Thank you for um, being patient with us when we, we feel you, Lord, and we don't do as we, we should, Lord. And Lord, we, we thank you just for the patience that you have in, in uh, tarrying, Lord, and not um, coming, returning, Lord, but your patience so that more people may come to know you, Lord. And we just thank you for that, Lord, and thank you for your love for the lost, Lord. And Lord, we just pray for anyone here this morning who, who doesn't know you, Lord, that um, they would come to know you even this morning, Lord, and that you would just speak into their hearts this morning, Lord. Lord, we, we thank you, Lord, just for a Sunday, Lord. We thank you for uh, the blessing it is to have a, a day of rest, Lord, and a day um, where we can gather together and uh, come and worship you, Lord, and spend time in your presence, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you um, for how you planned that out, Lord, as part of your perfect plan. Lord, we pray for this morning, Lord. We just pray that you would just uh, be with all those that take part, Lord. We pray for Mike as he does the children's talk, Lord. We just pray that you just speak into the hearts of the children through him, Lord. We pray for uh, the, uh, all those in the AV team, Lord, and for musicians, Lord, and for those that will be helping out in junior church and creche and all the different things, Lord. We just thank you for them, Lord, and for their willingness to serve you, Lord. And we just pray even that uh, you would bless them as they serve you even this morning, Lord. Lord, we pray for those in our congregation that are going through difficulties, Lord. We pray for Ella, Lord. We pray that you just help her. Uh, we pray that you just encourage her, Lord. We pray for the wider family, Lord. We just pray that you would just be with them, Lord, and give them a sense of peace at this time, Lord. And Lord, we just pray that you would just heal Ella, Lord, and pray that she would just know your presence there in hospital, Lord, and uh, just help her, Lord. We pray too for um, Roy, Lord. We just pray that you continue helping him as he uh, recovers from his heart attack, Lord. And we pray for others in our church, Lord, that have suffered different things in the last few days, Lord. We pray for Fred too, Lord. We pray that you would continue being with him as he re recovers from his heart attack, Lord. And for others too that maybe we don't even know um, what they're going through, Lord, or the difficulties we face, Lord. We just pray that you'd be with them and just help them just and encourage them this morning, Lord. Lord, we, we just uh, thank you again just that we can gather here, Lord, and we just pray that you would be in every aspect of this service, Lord. We, we thank you for the songs that we can sing to you, Lord. We thank you for uh, those that you've inspired with words, Lord, and music, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you for that, Lord, and thank you that uh, we can uh, sing these words of praise to you, Lord. And Lord, we pray that uh, we would just sing these songs glorifying you, Lord, and really mean the words, Lord. And Lord, we pray that through all aspects of this service this morning, you would be glorified. Lord, we just thank you again for who you are and what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, um, we're now going to have the children's talk, so Mike's going to come and give us our children's talk. Thank you, Mike. Well, good morning, everyone, boys and girls. It's, it's lovely to see you. We have spent the last few weeks um, looking at the children of Israel as they came to the Promised Land. We have done the book of Deuteronomy, and then we've been into the book of Joshua. And if you remember, it's maybe three or four weeks ago now, we started with these two mountains, and the children of Israel were just about to come into the promised land, and Moses led them to these two mountains, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, and they had to climb the mountains. And they talked about how if we obey God, if we trust in God, and if we follow God, God was going to be with them. But if they disobey God, then God was going to be angry with them and was going to be angry at their sin. And Moses wanted the people to choose. 
And then we turned over a few chapters and we read about Moses becoming very old and Moses died and Joshua took over leading the people and we kept coming on these words, be strong and be courageous. Moses told the people to be strong and courageous. Moses told Joshua to be strong and courageous. God told Joshua to be strong and courageous. The people told Joshua to be strong and courageous. We kept getting this message and we thought a little bit about how we can be strong and how we can be courageous as Christians. And then we learned last week a little bit about this story where they came to the big city of Jericho and two spies went into Jericho and they met Rahab. And we had this verse where Rahab said to the the two spies, everyone in Jericho is scared because we know that your God is the God of heaven and the God of earth. And that's why we can be strong and that's why we can be courageous because God's powerful and God is everywhere. And so the spies went back to the people and then it was time to come to the city of Jericho. But before we get to the city of Jericho, I want you to have a wee think about these pictures. There's something going on with these pictures. There's one word that helps explain what's going on in all of these pictures. And I wonder if anybody can work out the word. It's like a really tricky wee puzzle this morning. Can you work out what the word is? Yes. Opposites. Well done. Fantastic. Opposites. Good boys. We've got hot and cold. We've got heavy and light. We've got day and night. And we've got fast and slow. We've got opposites. And what we're going to get this morning is a story of opposites. A story of complete opposites when two things couldn't be more different. And so the Israelites turned up to the city of Jericho. There it is with its big, big walls all around the city. And when their army turned up to Jericho, they noticed everybody inside. They must be really scared. Because they saw the Israelites coming and the gates were closed. And nobody was outside the city. And everything seemed very quiet because everybody was hiding inside the city. And God gave the people some instructions about what they had to do. And the instructions were sort of strange. The instructions were, whenever you get to Jericho for six days, you're going to gather all of your army and you're going to gather all of the people and we're all going to march around the city. And we're just going to march around the city once. And then on the seventh day, we're going to march around the city seven times and we're going to blow our trumpets and we're going to shout And God said that he would give them a great victory if they obeyed him. Remember all the way back to the mountains we talked about at the start, God had told the people if they obey him, if they follow him, if they trust him, he would bless them and he would be with them. And now we're going to test it out because we're at Jericho and we get these strange, strange instructions. But God promised he would give them the city. But when he gave them the city, they had to go in and they had to kill the people who lived in the city. And they weren't allowed to take anything out of the city for themselves. Anything that they found, they had, to, they had to give it to God. So the people turned up. And the army gathered. And they marched around the city. And they marched all the way around the walls. And it was all very quiet and all very strange. And the people in the city were looking out at them thinking, what is going on? What are these people doing just walking around? Are they looking for a way in? Do they not see that we've closed the gates? They're just trying to figure out how to get in. And we did this day after day after day after day after day until we came to the seventh day when they marched round seven times. And at the end of the seven times, they did what God said. They blew their trumpets and everybody shouted. And God made the big walls fall down and the army was able to rush into Jericho and they were able to take the city. They were able to defeat the city because God had been with them and God helped them. But there was one man And he did something that he wasn't supposed to do. Remember, they weren't supposed to take anything out of the city for themselves. I don't know what he took, but a man called Achan found something in the city that he wanted to keep. And he stuck it under his jacket and he ran away back to his tent and he hid it underneath his tent and he disobeyed God. And then we come to the opposite because we had a big, big city and God helped them to beat a big, big city. But then they came to a little place called Ai. They came to a little town called Ai where they thought everything was going to be really, really easy. And when they got to this little town called Ai, Joshua said, you know what, it's it's going to be easy. It's going to be easy. We'll not even send the whole army. We'll just send some of the army. 
and their little small army went off to Ai, thinking it was going to be really, really easy. But they lost. God didn't help them to beat Ai, because this man Achan had disobeyed God. He had chosen not to do what God had said, and so God wasn't going to bless them when they went to Ai. God wasn't going to help them, and they lost. And the Bible says that they had to run away from Ai, and lots of, lots of the Israelite army were killed whenever they went to Ai because lots of them lost, because they, they lost and they all had to run away. And no boys and girls, eventually, Joshua came and he prayed to God, and he wanted to know what had gone wrong, and God told him about Achan, and they worked out who it was. They worked out that Achan had taken something from Jericho, and he'd taken it and hidden it under his tent, and the people had to say sorry for, for disobeying God. And you know what Joshua did? Joshua got all of the people and all of the army and he got all of them together and he marched them all back the way. He marched them all back the way to where we started four weeks ago. He marched them all the way back to the mountains, Ebal and Gerizim, and he made them all stand at the bottom of the mountains again and he read to them everything that Moses had said to them on those mountains when we read about it four weeks ago. And if you remember, it was three or four weeks ago anyway, we, we read a little bit of it and we said it went on for chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter. I think it was about 15 chapters we said of Deuteronomy was Moses reading out God's law. And Joshua did exactly the same. He took them back to the mountains and he read out God's law to them and he reminded them if you're going to trust God, if you're going to obey God, if you're going to follow God, he will be with you. But if you disobey God, he won't. And he wanted them to learn their lesson. He wanted them to learn that they have to do what God says. They have to trust in God and follow God if they want God to be with them and to bless them. And that's really the way the rest of the book of Joshua goes. God is with them and they go to lots of cities and they, they fight against lots of kings and lots of armies. And then we get to a really, really famous verse at the end of Joshua. Because now Joshua is a wee old man as well. And he gathers all the people together one more time. And he reminds them of all the wonderful things that God has done for them. And he gathers all the people together and he says, Do you remember what God did for us at Jericho? Do you remember how he made the walls fall down? And do you remember when we beat this king? And do you remember when we beat this army? And do you remember when God helped us in this big fight and he was with us and he blessed us and he helped us through all of it? And he says to the people, you can either choose to follow God or you can choose to follow something else. But I want you to remember all the wonderful things that God has done for us. And he gives them all these reminders. And then he says this really famous verse in the Bible. He says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Because he wants the people to remember all of the wonderful things that God has done for them. And boys and girls, we can do the same thing this morning. We can remember all of the wonderful things that God has done for us. We can remember that God has created the world for us. We can remember that God has given us our families and our homes, but we can remember that God has given us his son and that his son died for us so that we can have our sins taken away. And Joshua was saying, God has been good to us and he's been with us and he's helped us and he's given us wonderful things and there's nobody else you can go to who will be able to help you like that. And boys and girls, we can say that this morning. God has given us his son so that we can have our sins taken away because he died for us on the cross. There's nobody else we can go to. There's nowhere else we can go to if we want our sins to be taken away. But we have to choose to give our lives to God. We have to ask him to take away our sins. And so the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Joshua, the people keep being told to choose. And boys and girls, we have to choose this morning. Are we going to ask God to take our sins away? Are we going to follow him? Are we going to trust in him? Or are we going to try and find it somewhere else? But I hope that you are trusting in God because God will be with us and God will bless us. And it's only God who can take our sins away. And sometimes it's just really good to be reminded of that. The people needed to be reminded 
The people needed to be taken all the way back to the mountain to be reminded. And isn't it good that we can come to church and we can come to Pathfinders and that we have our own Bibles at home that can remind us of all the wonderful things that God has done for us. But boys and girls, I hope that you are choosing to give your life to God this morning. And that's us coming to the end of Deuteronomy and Joshua for a wee while. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Mike. So, um, again, very warm welcome to you all this morning. And for those on Zoom, warm welcome to you. Um, we're just going to go on to our announcements. Um, it's great to have Charlie with us here this morning. Charlie, it's great to have you with us, and we look forward to what you have to share with us later. Um, so, there's a few uh, additional announcements um, that I'll get through first. First of all, um, as you probably all know, we as a church send a gift to our, our missionary families um, over Christmas, so uh, with just a wee note here from the Singletons. Uh, thank you so much for your gift. We appreciate it very much indeed. It only arrived yesterday and we realized it was sent in mid-December. It was a real encouragement to get that in the post. We are so grateful to you all for your continued and consistent love, care, prayer and support. It means so much to have you as a church family behind us in all of our lives and service for God. We do look forward to when we can see you in person. And that's from Joan and Stephen. Um, also then this week, it is in the announcements, but just a special reminder that this week we have our Strayed uh, Faith Mission Rally um, on Wednesday at 8. And uh, Naomi Dudgeon will be giving a report and David Bennett will be speaking. So please remember that. Um, also this week, there's a, a very special birthday. So there is. Um, now, I won't tell you what age this person will be, but last year they were 89, so you can easily work it out. Um, so, Sam, we wish you a very happy birthday this week, so we do, um, and hope you have a great day. Um, I think that is all the additional announcements. We'll move on to our announcement sheet. So, um, this evening we have Philip Berry from Lisburn Congregational coming to uh, join with us, and I think... Um, there'll be also his daughters are coming to sing as far as I know, so uh, if you can make it out to that, um, please uh, try your best. That would be great to see you out. Um, then on Monday, we have our small group Bible study at 8 p.m. Uh, on Tuesday, we have our Mums and Tots. Wednesday is our Faith Mission Rally. Uh, Thursday is our morning prayer time at 10 a.m. Friday, we have Junior and Senior Pathfinders at 7, and Straight Youth are going to Junkyard Golf at 8.15. Uh, Saturday then, remember, is our men's fellowship dinner, and today is the last day uh, for booking that, so if you can, remember, there's a wee list out the back, and um, please put your, your name on, on that, and if you could have the correct payment on the night, that would just make things run a bit smoother. Um, if you, you can make that your way there yourself if you want, or we will be meeting in the church car park at 6.15, so um, if you do want to meet in the church park, it will be meeting at 6.15. Then on Sunday at 10.15, we have Sunday school. And then at half 11, we have our morning worship with the Sunday school prize giving. And uh, Mr. David Burke will be speaking at that. And then in our evening worship, we'll have Dr. Alan Meenan again. Uh, and his topic is the word is out. Um, so just put that in your diaries too. Um, just on the Sunday school prize giving, uh, the Faith Mission Book Fair will be here in the church on Friday the 3rd from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., so just keep that in mind. Um, also, uh, the, there are two uh, diaconate vacancies declared um, at, for the upcoming uh, March members meeting, and uh, those uh, nominations have to be in by the 14th of February, so just keep that in mind. Uh, my time has come uh, finished, so I'm up for nominate or renomination and there's also uh, there's two vacancies there so there are so or there's one further vacancy or two vacancies all together um, I think that is all the announcements as far as I can see I've probably forgotten something oh yes um, just thank you for all those that prayed for uh, the meet meeting on uh, Thursday with the HCD and planning and um, so just a wee update on that and um, I wasn't able to make it, but uh, some of the deacons uh, met with the HED and planning. They came here and pretty much uh, planning, or HED gave their side to um, 
why we couldn't do what we planned to do, and we gave our arguments as to um, why we couldn't make any more compromises on the plans that we submitted. Um, so I, I think it was a good meeting. Um, we have no firm answers from that, um, but we're going to now um, submit uh, a document uh, stating uh, in writing the reasons why we can't make fully further compromises on the plans that we submitted. Um, so just continue to pray for that um, and uh, pray that the Lord's will would uh, be done in that. And I think that is all the announcements. So we're going to have our second hymn and after this, uh, Charlie's going to take over. Thank you, Charlie. And our second hymn is Light of God, Come Dwell Within Your People. And we'll stand to sing these words and the children can go out to Children's Church uh, on the last verse. Well, good morning, everyone. 
It's good to be here. Uh, well, is it afternoon? It could be afternoon. Good afternoon. Good morning. It's good to be here amongst friends in Strayed and uh, trust that we may know the Lord's help and blessing as we come uh, to study his word. I give you the uh, greetings of the uh, church in Consbrook Avenue in Belfast and uh, would covet your prayers for us. Uh, we're a small uh, gathering of God's people. Um, we have about a dozen who come together on a Sunday morning, not so many on a Sunday night, uh, and we need the Lord to come and work and uh, build the, the work up. And I would covet your prayers uh, for the work in Consbrook. Um, we're going to uh, just turn to the Lord in a word of prayer before we turn and look at Mark chapter 2. Let's just turn to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have the scriptures in our hand to read, uh, to search and to study, and that in them we have eternal life, for it is in them that speak, they speak of and bear witness about Christ, and that all scripture is breathed out by you and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness. We thank you that Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope, and that we have your word as a lamp shining in a dark place, shedding light on who you are and what you require of us. We thank you, O Father, O Lord of heaven and earth, that the things which you have hidden from the wise and understanding and which many prophets and kings desire to see but did not, are revealed to someone like ourselves, for such is your gracious will. Now, Father, as we come to read and study your word, come and speak to us. Lord, we pray, open our eyes and our understanding, move in our hearts and minds, and help us to be doers of the word of God, because it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn to... Uh, Luke, uh, uh, sorry, Mark chapter 2. I have to move this on somehow. All right, okay. Oh, yes. Okay, sorry. These technical things. Right, Mark chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. It's a well known uh, portion of the Word of God. It's a portion that means a lot to me because this was the portion of Scripture that the Lord used. Uh, to bring me to trust in the Saviour. When Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus Perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose, and immediately picked up his bed, and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Amen. May God add his blessing as we read that portion of his word together. So I'm hoping this works. There we go. First point. Now, I'm sure 
uh, and I have to be careful what I say here, that some of you have, uh, are aware of what the Antiques Roadshow is. It's probably the older generation, and that's where I get in trouble, who might watch such a program where people bring uh, their objects to the experts to get looked at, examined, and valued. And sometimes, unfortunately, people get disappointed. There was a, a case some years ago where a, a man brought what he thought was an expensive a glass jar, he had spent over a thousand pound buying it and unfortunately the expert said, well, uh, I'm afraid it's an empty olive oil bottle, Tesco, circa 2008, it's worth nothing at all. Uh, yes, you can, uh, you can imagine the disappointment of that man. Uh, how foolish he must have failed. But there are other uh, instances where the opposite happens. Uh, a lady wanted to bring her grandfather's uh, grandfather clock, uh, or her grandfather's clock, uh, to be valued. But the makers didn't want large, argue, uh, large uh, uh, pieces to look at. And so instead of going away disappointed, she thought, what else can I bring? And she went home and she found her uh, grandfather's first ever mint copy of the Dandy and the Beano. And she took them along, not really expecting much, but they were <coughs> valued at £7,000. Brian, go and get your Dandy and your Beano out. You could be in a bit of money there, I think. She went home with more than she bargained for. She went home with more than she expected. And so did the man in the passage that we were reading from in Mark chapter 2. I wonder if that's ever happened to you. You've got more than you've bargained for in a positive way, because we could look at it in a negative way as well. But have you ever got more than you bargained for? Something's happened, you were expecting something, but you got far more. It has happened. Well, I want to go through this passage very, uh, hopefully, quickly and explain it, look at a few things and bring out some application for us. And the first point, as you can see up there, is the preaching of Jesus. In chapter 1, Mark tells us that Jesus has been in Galilee. I'll have a map up in a minute. Uh, you'll see where Galilee is, uh, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus was a preacher, a teacher, and he was going throughout this area of Galilee proclaiming that. Not only did he uh, proclaim and preach, but he healed people. Uh, he entered a place called Capernaum, which is right at the north. You'll see that in a minute, hopefully. And in Capernaum, he cast out a demon from, or demons from a man who was in the synagogue. He healed Peter's mother-in-law, who was uh, full of fever. And he healed many others. When people heard that he was there and what he had done to this man in the synagogue and Peter's mother-in-law, they brought all kinds of people with all kinds of illnesses to Jesus. And he healed them all. And then he carries on preaching and traveling around Galilee and he heals a man full of leprosy. And then we come to chapter 2 and we read at the very beginning of chapter 2 that he returned to Capernaum. And Capernaum, I'm not sure how well you'll see this, the bl blue blob at the top is the Sea of Galilee and there you can see right at the top is Capernaum. Jericho, which uh, Mike mentioned, is down near the bottom of that long squiggly blue line, the, the River Jordan. So, and there's Jerusalem. So Galilee is up there where Capernaum is, that area up there, and it's the furthest part, point away from Jerusalem. And Jesus came back to that seaport of Capernaum again. But I say to you that it was a different Capernaum. 
I don't mean geographically, it was the same town, but things were different this time when Jesus came to Capernaum. Why do I say that? Well, you had all these people who were healed and restored to health and strength again. They would be walking around the streets of Capernaum like living advertisements for the Lord Jesus Christ. People who were, uh, you knew who were seriously ill would be meeting you down the street, walking along, chatting as if they had no problems at all. People who knew Peter's mother-in-law and knew how seriously ill she was would be asking, well, how are you better? They didn't have medicines like we do today. Uh, People would be intrigued. How are you better? The man who was full of a demon acting weirdly in the synagogue is there in his right mind. How did that happen? All these people who were healed and restored would be able to share, well, Jesus, this man Jesus, he spoke to me, he touched me, and I was made well. So you can imagine that there would be this great um, uh, eagerness amongst the people of Capernaum to see Jesus. And when they hear he's back, it says in the house, or it was at home, I don't want to go into that, what home was it? It could have been uh, the same one he was in before, Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, But when people knew he was back in Capernaum, what did they do? They flocked to see him. They wanted to have uh, miracles. They wanted to see people restored to health and strength again. Maybe they wanted... uh, to be healed themselves. Maybe they wanted to find out how these people were healed, but they flocked to see Jesus. The house was chock-a-block, wasn't it? When they got there, I think they might have been a bit disappointed. Jesus wasn't healing people. It wasn't a sideshow, was it? It wasn't like the circus has come to town and everyone goes off to the circus. Jesus wasn't going around just entertaining people he was there preaching he was preaching he was preaching the word to them the word of God Jesus had a far more important work to do than to heal heal people to restore people to health and strength he was preaching the word of God he was preaching the gospel He was explaining to people that there is a God in heaven who they are answerable to. He was preaching that they are separated from God because God is holy and pure and they're not. And they need to be reconciled to God and they can't do that through their own efforts. They can't do it through their own religion. They can only come to God and be reconciled to God through him. And if people would believe and trust in him, then they would be saved. They would be reconciled to God. They would be forgiven, forgiven for all their sins. So Jesus was preaching. The second thing we notice is the persistence of these four men. While Jesus was in this house, and it was bunged full of people, four men bring their friend, uh, carrying him on a, like a blanket, verse 3. And when they got there, they could see they weren't getting in. They couldn't get in the door, because people were uh, at the door. People were uh, outside, because the house was full. Imagine you had brought your friend, carrying him on a a blanket, and you realised you weren't going to get in. What would you have done? Would you have gone home? Would you have thought, well, we'll come back another day? Uh, They didn't know Jesus was going to be there another day, did they? Uh, They didn't know how long Jesus would be in Capernaum. And they didn't go away, because they believed this was probably the only time that they would have to meet with Jesus, and they wanted Jesus to heal their friend. And so what did they do? Well, we know, don't we? They climbed up on top, and they began to pull away the turf and the mud that was on the roof, and they would 
uh, begin to peer in and they would make a hole big enough where Jesus was. Now imagine if you're sitting here this morning and suddenly bits of wood uh, come from the ceiling. Uh, you wouldn't stand around, would you? You'd be wondering, what's going on? Uh, you can imagine what Jesus thought and what the people in the house thought, what's going on? And then suddenly they'd see the sunlight shining through and then there are these four faces peering in and then they lowered their friend down to Jesus. That's quite incredible when we realise these four men were not put off coming to Jesus because of the crowd. They weren't put off coming to Jesus. The third thing that we notice is the pardon given by Jesus. The pardon. They began to lower this man down through the roof and Jesus looks up at them and he says something remarkable, doesn't he? He doesn't say to the man, uh, I see your faith and you are healed. Rise up, take up your bed and walk. He doesn't, does he? He says, your sins are forgiven you. He saw in the friends and he saw in this man a tremendous faith. Why would they be taking a paralyzed man to Jesus? Because they believed he was able to heal him. They believed that he was someone unique. He was someone different. He wasn't just an ordinary person. I believe that they saw him as who he claimed to be, the Son of God. And they believed that because of who he was, he was able to restore their friend to health. And when he saw their faith, he said to the man, your sins are forgiven you. On account of their faith in Jesus, their man had his sins forgiven. Why didn't Jesus forgive the others? Well, maybe they were already forgiven. I'll leave that with, with you to, to ponder. This man wasn't. Maybe he was doubting. Maybe he was a doubter, but then... Uh, he did, did come to believe. And when Jesus saw the faith, he gave this man forgiveness for his sins. The next thing that we see, not everyone was happy. Not everyone was happy. You would have thought, wouldn't you, the fact that they'd seen this great miracle taking place, this paralyzed man, was now restored to health and strength and he was, uh, uh, or, or he was going to be, when they saw uh, what Jesus had done to all these other people, that they would have been pleased, that they would have been uh, rejoicing, but they weren't. They protested, didn't they? And it's interesting what they said. When they heard Jesus say, your sins are forgiven you, they were thinking amongst themselves, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, they're absolutely right, aren't they? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Yes, we can forgive people the sins they commit against us, but ultimately it's only God who can forgive sins. This is what the Old Testament teaches the scribes were students of the law. They knew the word of God. They knew for anyone to take upon themselves an attribute of God was blasphemy and it deserved death. Leviticus 24 tells us, whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the native. When he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. So here they are thinking, who is this man? Who does he think he is? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Either this is blasphemy, or, and they never thought this, this is 
God. God in the form of man. And therefore he is able to forgive this man's sins. God is a forgiving God. Bless the Lord, O my soul, says the psalmist, and forget not all his benefit, who forgives all your iniquity and who heals all your diseases. Again, when he speaks through Jeremiah regarding the new covenant, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. The scribes were right. Who can forgive sins but God alone? But they were wrong to think that this man was blaspheming because he wasn't just a man. He was God in the form of man. He was the son of God. And the final point we see is the power of Christ. Jesus knew their thinking and he asked the scribes, why do you think like this? You, you know, sometimes we know what people are thinking. We can tell by the expression on their face. My wife, well, she, she knows everything. She, she's always right. She knows what I'm thinking. You know, I can't, I can't escape that. We can look and we can see by people's expression, can't we? Sometimes what they're thinking. Jesus knew their heart. He knew what was going on. Uh, again, these scribes should have thought, when Jesus said, why are you thinking these things? They should have thought, how does he know? How does he know my thoughts? How does he know what's going on here? They should have thought, shouldn't they, that this is interesting. This person is different, but they didn't. To prove that Jesus was able to forgive sins because he was God in the form of man. He says to them, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? What's easiest? What do you think would be the easiest thing there, to say your sins are forgiven or to rise up and take your bed? The easiest thing is to say, your sins are forgiven because you can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't examine it, can you? Someone can say to me, Charlie, I forgive you. Uh, initially, I don't know if they've forgiven me. How do I know they've forgiven me? Maybe as time goes on and I see a change in their attitude towards me, I can say, well, yes, I know they have forgiven me. But you can't put it in a, a laboratory and examine that can you so that's the easy thing to say I could tell you something and you could have no clue uh, or how to prove what I'm saying if I said or Jesus said to this man your sins are forgiven but rise up and walk the rising up and walking is the most difficult because if Jesus said to him rise up and walk and he didn't everyone could see it Everyone would know that Jesus was a failure. That every, uh, everyone would know that Jesus was a fraud. But he didn't. Jesus did the hardest of the two to show that he could do the easiest of the two. And he said to the man, rise up and walk. And immediately the man rose up and he walked. Therefore demonstrating to the people that by doing the hardest of the two, he could forgive sins. And therefore, he was the Son of God. He was who he claimed to be. Now, I hope you followed along, because this is a, an important passage to look at. What lessons do we learn about the healing of uh, this man? This morning I'm talking to quite a, a number of people. I know some of you, I've been getting to know uh, some of you over the last uh, few years as I uh, have visited and helped out in a, a little way. I don't know all of you and I don't know where you stand before God. And I want to ask you this question this morning. If you are not a Christian, 
What is putting you off coming to Christ? You've heard the gospel, you've heard and you know and maybe you believe there is a God that you are accountable to and one day you have to stand before you know that. And you know you're a sinner. You don't need someone to tell you that. You know yourself that you've done things that you're ashamed of and you wouldn't want other people to know about. And you know that you need forgiveness. But you've never come to the Lord Jesus. And the reason that you've never come to the Lord Jesus and confessed your sins is because of other people. What would my wife say if I told her I was a Christian? What would my workmate say if I told them I was a Christian. Don't be put off coming to Jesus because of other people. This group of four men, they wanted Jesus to heal their friend and they were not put off by the crowd. They weren't put off by the huge number of people who were standing there blocking the way. They did all that they could to come to Jesus. And I would urge you, don't put off coming to Jesus another day. Don't put off coming to Jesus another day. Come today. Trust him now. Don't worry about your friends. Don't worry about your family. Get right with God today. Trust in the Lord. The second lesson that I think we see here, and for believers particularly, How thankful we ought to be that there is a way back to God. How thankful we ought to be that God is a forgiving God. Where would we be if God was not a forgiving God? If God was not gracious and merciful? How thankful we ought to be that God has opened up the way for us to be reconciled to him. And how thankful we ought to be that it's not through what we do. How sad it is when people think that they are good enough for heaven. They don't need Jesus because they're good enough for heaven. Friends, no one is good enough for heaven. God doesn't look upon us and see the good that we do. God looks upon us and sees the the wrong that we've done, doesn't he? And it's the wrong that we have done that separates us from God. And it's the wrong things that we do that need to be dealt with. And it's so sad that one thing people do in this life is they never deal with their sin. They never deal with their sin. But how thankful we ought to be that God is a forgiving God and he forgives everyone who comes to him through the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of us. It doesn't matter our age. It doesn't matter the color of our skin. It doesn't matter if we're male or female. It doesn't matter if we're English or Northern Irish, or wherever it is we're from, God is willing to forgive everyone who comes to him in repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is willing to forgive us every last sin. He doesn't forgive us some. How horrific that would be if, as it were, we got to the gates of heaven And we knocked on the door and someone opened the door. This doesn't happen, I'm just using my uh, weird imagination. And they said, why should we let you in? Well, I've been forgiven. Have you confessed all your sin, every last one? Uh, No? Well, sorry, you can't come in. I confessed all the bad ones. No, you can't come in. How thankful we ought to be this morning that God is a forgiving God, that Christ can save, he does save, and he has saved 
all who come to believe in him. And when I was struggling with my sins, and could God forgive me, could Jesus ever save me, this proved to me that he could. And it was through this passage that God spoke to me and brought me to the Lord. The last thing, we started off thinking about someone who got more than they bargained for. Again, if we have come to Christ for forgiveness of sins, yes, he has forgiven us all our sins, yesterday, today, and all our sins still to come, but he has given us so much more. When we come to Christ for forgiveness, we go home with so much more, don't we? And we could be here all morning thinking about the many blessings that we have in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes uh, to uh, the church uh, of Rome, in uh, church in Rome, or in Romans chapter 5, therefore since we have been justified by faith, there we are, we've put our faith in the Lord Jesus and we have been justified, we've been declared righteous. Ah, but that's not all. Since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace, access into the very presence of God and God's grace in which we stand. We, re we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. How thankful we ought to be this morning as the people of God that when we have repented and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, we go home with far more than we ever imagined, far more than we ever bargained for. Yes, we are justified. Yes, we have peace with God. Yes, we have access by faith into his grace. Yes, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And we can go on and on and on, can't we? And look at all the spiritual blessings with which we have been blessed. As we... Uh, leave now as we go our homeward way. I trust that what's been said this morning will make you think where do you stand before the Lord? What is stopping you coming to faith in the Lord Jesus? Is it your friends? Is it your family? Don't be put off by the crowd. Come to Jesus today. I hope we can go into this week full of praise and thanksgiving as we thank and praise God that he is a forgiving God. Because without him being a forgiving God, we would be lost without hope. And we would be on that broad way that leads to destruction. But he has forgiven us, and he's forgiven us all our sins. And we can rejoice this week that he has given us far more than we could ever imagine. We're justified, we have peace we have this access into his presence. We have the hope of glory and so much more. As you read the word of God during the week, may you find these nuggets of what God has done for you, each and every one of us who believe and trust in Jesus and rejoice in him and praise him more and more. Amen. May God add his blessing as we read his word and hear his word together. We're going to uh, have our closing hymn. We'll stand to sing.
Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you uh, for what we learn from it. Thank you that Jesus is able to forgive. He's willing to forgive all who come to him in repentance and faith. We thank you for this hymn that reminds us of the love that brought Jesus into this world to die for us so that we might be forgiven. He is the sacrifice who takes away the anger of God. And we thank you that he is our sacrifice. He is the one who took our penalty and our punishment upon himself so that we might be forgiven. And we thank you that you look upon us as those who have been forgiven in Christ. Thank you that you don't hold our sins against us anymore. Thank you that you have loved us so much. Help us to love you more. Help us to serve you better day by day. Help us to rejoice in you and enjoy you more and more as we contemplate who you are and all that you've given to us through Christ. Bless, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you. 